Welcome back to Lead the Standard. This is episode 16, Embracing Diverse Thinkers, Strategies for Inclusive and Effective Collaboration. We're exploring the power of neurodiversity in the workplace in this episode. So how do you effectively collaborate with our work colleagues or clients who think differently, especially in a field as seemingly structured as ISO conformance? Join me as I explore a personal experience that taught me the importance of adapting our leadership approach to meet diverse needs. I'm thrilled to have Caitlin Merrin, a neurodivergent ISO consultant and powerhouse in our industry, join us to break down the collaboration model we've created together. Whether you're leading a team or working with clients, this episode will provide you with actionable strategies to harness the strengths of diverse thinkers and build a more inclusive, effective work environment. Don't miss out. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Lead the Standard. I'm Jackie Stapleton, and you're turn not turning, you're tuning into episode 16, Embracing Diverse Thinkers, Strategies for Inclusive and Effective Collaboration. As usual, this podcast is an extension of our weekly Lead the Standard LinkedIn newsletter, which was edition number 63, if you want to check that one out. This week, I am excited to be joined by a very special guest, Caitlin Merrin from Merrin Co. Caitlin is a very successful ISO consultant and what I say is an absolute powerhouse. Caitlin is the reason I wrote this article in the first place. And now, of course, we have the pleasure of having Caitlin as part of the podcast to further extend her experiences with my story, which I'll share shortly. Caitlin, did you want to just sort of quickly add how how you came about, how we met, what we've been doing, just just a little bit of background before we delve into my faux pas? Absolutely. (laughs) So thank you for that intro. Um, It's funny, I guess, because I work by myself all the time. You don't get feedback (laughs) on anything that you do. (laughs) I mean, of course, with your clients, but it's it's nice to hear it from somebody else, I guess, when you work alone. So the way that I guess we cross paths, I think like seven years ago, which it, I don't know, it feels like yesterday, to be honest, but it's <laughs> it's been so long. Um, I had just finished my course in auditing and because of the way that my brain works, I was finding it really difficult to, uh, the course was really jam-packed into like, I think it was like seven days or five days or something. And it was so much to absorb and I was still processing it. And then I didn't actually understand what it looked like in the, you know, in the real world, like how to apply it. And you get all this technical information of, you know, jargon and standards and, um, you know, how to do, you know, how to interview people and how to do audits and all that kind of stuff, which is important, but it didn't really give me the practical knowledge that I was looking for, which I guess is difficult to put into such a short course when there's so much content to absorb. So I was looking, I was, you know, searching online for something that offered further information. I came across order training online and then I reached out. And then um, I think it was Lee, actually your husband that I spoke to. And he said, um, funny enough, Jackie is looking for, you know, for someone to talk to about something similar so we ended up catching up and you know the rest is history we've we've been catching up ever since and you've been invaluable to my growth and my business so it's it's um it was my lucky day (laughs) it was it was both (laughs) our lucky days it was it was meant to happen and um I think it's a common story that you know people do that like the training um, whether it's classroom, online, virtual, it doesn't matter. And the, yeah, that additional support and look, and we'll touch on it as we work through um, our points to discuss in this podcast. But you, where you've taken yourself and your business is just amazing. So I really appre- appreciate you taking the time to, to be here today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. so. 
let's get started on the topic. So in this episode, <clears throat> I'm going to share an experience I had. So this is my own experience I had with Caitlin. And then I'm going to extend that a bit further. Caitlin and I are going to extend on it. So mm -hmm. the story, I actually shared the story in edition 63 of the Lead the Standard newsletter, but I'll recap on it. So the story that I shared was that I had an experience within the last year, I couldn't remember when it was, Caitlin, that made me reflect on how I approach one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with clients. During a discussion about my client's next steps, you know, I'm going to burst the bubble, that client is Caitlin, so I'm, I'm sharing that now. <clears throat> During a discussion that I actually had with Caitlin about the next, her next steps to gain more clients and traction in the industry, which is one of many things we talk about, on reflection, like after the call, I sort of felt I came on a bit strong, thinking that, you know, Caitlin was just trying to hide behind like these trivial tasks or, you know, how we all make these excuses or reasons why we can't do anything. Oh, if we just do this, if we just do this. And I sort of felt maybe she was hiding behind those rather than just taking direct action. And during that discussion, as I said, I felt like I came on a bit strong. This is this was, you know, in reflection. Um, mm -hmm. So as I said, of course, this is Caitlin. After the call, as I said, I reflected on our interaction. I look back at what I said. I look back at how you responded, Caitlin, and I realised I possibly hadn't considered your neurodivergence and the specific needs that you have to manage your pathway through things. I sort of just went in like a bull at a gate. Um, I thought I was, you know, you know, hard, hard love, tough love. That's maybe what I thought I was doing. Um, but mm -hmm. I really hadn't considered. And I knew, I know how you work and operate, but I felt that I I lost myself in that interaction. So I felt I'd been inconsiderate. Um, and recognised I could have handled it better. You know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. So as court, as Caitlin did teach me, whether we are neurodivergent or neurotypical, we all have different needs and styles to move forward. And as a consultant, an auditor, any type of ISO professional, we need to identify these early on with our clients and ourselves, of course, so that we can modify our own behaviour to get the best and the most out of the people that we're working with. So I'll just repeat that because I think I need to repeat it not only like for myself, possibly you, you're having some light bulb moments too, Caitlin, but I feel... As, as someone that works with other consultants, as other prof ISO professionals, part of that process, and look, even as a consultant, and you'll back me up here, you sort of need to figure out based on your client's responses to you, whether it's um, verbal, tone, body language, general response or reaction, you need to sort of figure out how, how they're working and then for me, I always think the power is with me to adjust my behaviour to support what I've identified. Um, and I suppose I'm going to say my behaviour or how I handled that call I, on reflection, I felt even worse because I'm very aware of how you operate and what you need to move forward. So I don't know that you were at the time, though. I think that you had an idea of it. I don't think we were at a place where 
so I guess there's a shared responsibility and um, whether it's in your personal life or whether it's at work, it's really important to, you're not always going to get it right and you're not always going to know what the other person's thinking or what's best for them. The best thing is that you are able to communicate it. So we have come to a place where even though you now know how I operate and and how to manipulate me in the best way possible to get <laughs> That way, yeah. you know, I need that and I'm open about that. But you wouldn't know that unless I can, you know, get the tools to help me understand what I need as well. So I was able to say, look, I can't learn when you send me this really beautiful instruction with a video or if you give me three weeks to do something and expect me to do it anywhere between four hours before it's due. So <laughs> like things like that, we've had to... Yeah okay to get it wrong but once you're asking and even though you're saying but that's that was your perception of what is the thing the right thing to do or the best action forward from your knowledge it's okay that you said that it's up to me also to say what you know suits my learning skills or how I operate so you can come in the middle and say okay well this is what I think this is how I think let's meet somewhere where we can move forward so I don't think you should always feel like the pressure to get it right every time it's more just the communication is there maybe even like I think I was listening to a podcast this morning about this like master negotiator um and he worked for the FBI and he was saying like a really good way to shut down an argument or to to resolve conflict is first ask the other person um explain to the other person what you think their perspective is and how they're interpreting the situation and I think if you put it back on, like even in therapy, they always they never really give you a solution. They always say, how does it make you feel? How do you interpret that? You know, and these are some of the things that um, you could expect. So maybe in that instance, when you're like trying to work with people um, and trying to understand what they need, instead of giving them a clear action plan, maybe asking, how would you like me to communicate with you? Um, what kind of you know, deadline works for you instead of saying, well, this is what you should do. Maybe give options and ask how it makes someone feel or how that sits with them. Mm. I think it's a good tool that I learned. And I was thinking about it this morning, actually. So I thought that is a good way in lots of ways to take that analogy, I guess, and apply it in different situations. I do like that shared responsibility mm. um, because, yeah, obviously I'm not, a, I'm not an expert um in this subject that's why I've got you um and you know obviously we've had discussions as well your knowledge is based on your own um diagnoses and experiences so with that shared responsibility do you think people are always comfortable to to say oh no that's that's not how I learn I need this or like do, do we do we make them feel comfortable enough to do that? I think uh I mean for me, yes, but you know what I'm like in a sense of I work for myself. I'm in my own world. I have come from years and years and years working in high stress, high paced corporate roles, mining roles where you have to, you know, deal with different people. Back then, I would not have been so comfortable with saying this is how I learn because it wasn't an, an environment where people were given that opportunity to say that. It was more so this is the environment and you need to fit into it. And I think that's where I came across a lot of issues when I was in the corporate environment because I am neurodivergent. I didn't understand it for a really long time. That's why I was put on like special projects and I was always given tasks that other people couldn't, you know, solve. I was always the problem solver. I was a business partner, all these things. And it was really hard for my managers to track what I you know the KPIs were so stringent and I even started changing some of the KPIs because I was like they only make sense in your department they don't make sense for the for what you're, we're trying to track across the company so we started changing KPIs to integrate with other departments um, and it took a lot of my years pushing up against people saying this is the way that I see it, and this is you know how I think you should do it and they started listening but it came you know it was met with a lot of you know what are you doing how come we can't see how much you know you've processed and and you know just really jumping down my throat about things like you're spending too much time and you know I remember one of my bosses that I spent too much time in the break room 
but I had figured out that nobody answers my emails. So every time I would like go and find them in the break room and I would start talking about something that we had common ground in and then I would slip in, oh, by the way, I'm having an issue with this. What do you think I should do instead of, you know, because the emails are just getting lost and then they would help me and then I would offer to help them with something and then I would resolve it. But to track that, they're seeing you're not at your desk, your queue's not getting sorted. Um, we don't know what you're doing. You're always in the break room. And I'm like, but the output is there. I just was, you know, yeah. smart enough to come up with these ways to get things resolved or to find solutions. They just weren't measurable, which was really hard for corporate yeah. time. Um, but now that I'm in my consulting space, I find that I think something that you told me early on in the piece when I was like really fresh and I was like, I can't have blonde hair and I can't do this. And I, you know, <laughs> dress a certain way and drive a nice car. Otherwise people won't take me seriously. I was just so desperate to be taken seriously because I looked so young and I was young. <laughs> that's why, but I had so much experience um, that I believed in myself, but I was just struggling to get other people. I thought I was struggling to get other people to take me seriously, but that just came with um, people did because of, you know, the way that I communicated. Um, mm -hmm. and way back then, I think we started talking about the ideal clients and, and I've definitely had people that have not liked and it's all and it's very small, but it's just like, if I don't like them, we will not mesh together. And yeah. if I do, if we do align, we're going to be great. And I think yeah. all my clients can attest to that. We all still work together or still keep in contact. So now that I feel safe in this space, I mean, I'm bringing in partnerships with companies that I work with really well. I deliver what they ask for because they I'm really sensitive to communication. So yeah. the communication is really open and every new client I have, I say, this is how I work. How do you like me to communicate with you? Some people are, please put it in a Monday, you know, list mm -hmm. so I can check it off. And then other people are like, please send it to me an email. And other people are like, please record it. So even though my communication style is always the same for me, there's always varying. So I always figure it out so that there's like no confusion, I guess. And then, so that allows me to tell people how I work and, yeah. and that clears up any of that miscommunication, I guess. Yeah. Um, that's how I've approached it in a roundabout. Yeah. Answer. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I can relate to that because I'm like, and you mentioned earlier, you, you like, I don't know if that's the right word, you normally get to your deadlines. I don't know. I think you said about four hours <laughs> before they're due. And I know that's how you work because of the commun like communications we've, we've had over the years. I don't work that way. But, and I'll, I'll share this because I, I know before we, when we, when we were planning this podcast, I wrote that newsletter, I think this is what it was, and I emailed that to you, I think, before I was going on a holiday, mm -hmm. and I asked if you could review it and have it back to me by a certain date. I think that was the day I was back from holiday, so then I could continue to plan. And, of course, when I got back, I didn't have a response from you. But I don't even I think I barely remembered to do it. <laughs> no, it, and and but you know what helped me from a you know from a person that doesn't you know doesn't leave things to the last minute. I wasn't stressed. I actually thought, I oh, know that's you know that's all right. I know how Caitlin works. I trusted that you'd have it to me. And I knew I had a little bit more sort of lead time and I knew that we were planning to catch up, I think, the following Tuesday. So, you know, in this instance with working with you and understanding how you work, it took the stress away from me and I still had that trust. Mm -hmm. I still knew you'd do it, but I knew you'd do it right right before when I needed it I knew you wouldn't be late and put me under stress but because we had that relationship and we had you know we we understand how each other works 
I guess what I'm trying to say is it takes the stress away from me as the person that's expecting something from you because I understand this is how it works. I wasn't stressed at all. If I didn't understand it, I'd be ringing on the phone, I'd be sending you text messages, I'd be slamming down emails and saying, where the hell is this, Caitlin? But I didn't need to do that. Well, I think that's the important piece is that, and I think that's why my clients and I work so well together, sometimes I wish I was able to answer things, you know, quicker. And I just, I think it, they understand, thankfully, that I am super reliable. So if there is something that they need, it's going to get done. And if it's like something that comes up last minute, especially I'm the person that fixes it for them. If they've got a tender, I'll stay up until midnight making sure that it's, you know, everything they need. I'll go above and beyond. Sometimes I have like 11 clients at once. So imagine my brain trying to, you know, keep on top of the millions of things that have to happen for every system and every tender that they're applying for and all that. So I think knowing all that context, even though, and that's the important bit of it, is that you know that I won't not do it. Yes. So... Yes, it's. I do try to manage that um, stress level, and I'm getting better and better at it um, with the systems I'm starting to put in place myself because I've gone through this like phase of relying so heavily on pressure. It's so magical to me because that's when my best work is done. You know, I had a system that I put in like I think the quickest I've ever put a system from scratch in. It was like three months from start to finish, tested it, audited it. You know, we did the we did the audit um, and stage one finished on Friday and stage two started on Monday because that was just the only time that we could get it done. Yeah. And it was a little bit stressful, but it pushed us all to get through it really quickly. And, you know, everyone was on board. We were all working really great together. And, you know, we got such great feedback. It was a near perfect system. So, yeah. you know, that instance where that's not how you want to operate all the time, obviously, but... I think having faith that those situations give me a lot of um, learning. So like now there's things, every time I am pushed under pressure, there's things that I put in place to make it easier and easier each time. So now I'm building up to having a system that like is essentially someone else, you know, I can have a project administrator come in and build it because there's so much of my knowledge. It's so clearly laid out. I've got it so systemized that it's broken down into layman's terms. So that yeah. pressure, whilst nothing, you know, it was only on me the pressure was happening realistically. Mm-hmm. It has me to, you know, put things in place so I don't have to always survive off that. Yeah. But yeah, um, there's things like my therapist said, like, you know, that's your process for certain things. So work with it instead of fighting against it. Love no. That that that's your process for things that are low dopamine you would say so there's a lot of things that leave to last minute because I don't want to do them they're not very exciting to Uh, me (laughs) yeah so I need that pressure that's the way an ADHD brain works like you need the pressure of either like you have to do it or you're going to get in trouble or if I try to sit down and do something that's you know not very giving me a lot of dopamine it's like I could sit at my desk and be like, I don't want to do this. Like I will try everything to get out of it. If I have four hours left, I will do it so well. And it will just, I will amaze myself at how, you know, how well I've been able to put that work out. So I guess you have to learn to, to go with. Yeah. Your process. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And I love how you said, you know, people know that you're reliable and I think that's that have faith as you mentioned as well so I think that's actually a good segue into Mm -hmm. what we created as part of this process um so I'm gonna say I'm certainly not an expert in this space um so that's why I had you Caitlin help me to put some sort of you know, information together. And what what we came up with was this collaboration model um, and it demonstrates the pros, cons and tips for working with diverse thinkers. Now, I just realised it says for working with diverse thinkers, but I think as we go through these pros, cons and the tips for working together, Obviously, you're going to share both 
both sides, aren't you, Caitlin? Because, you know, as a consultant in this space, what's that? What's that saying that you and you've told me before? I think your therapist mentioned it. What's the saying about being a neurodiverse oh, consultant? I always <laughs> I always say this. I was just saying it to a client the other day, actually, because she was talking about her son um, that is ADHD. I knew it before she even told me after the things that she was telling me she was experiencing. Uh, yeah. And I said to her, because even in, in the workplace, in life and in school, it's so diff- difficult because neurotypical people um, and neuro, so you have neurodiverse, which is multiple different things under one umbrella, but it's probably just the same amount of people that are neurotypical as neurodiverse yet we are being held to a neurotypical standard. We don't fit into that box. So schools aren't equipped to deal with children that have ADHD and autism on lower ends of the spectrum that are in classrooms with neurotypical children, like uh, in the workplace, in society, you know, it's like you're held to these standards that are created by people with one type of way of thinking, Mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be like that. And I mean, Sometimes my therapist says, you know, what is wrong with, you know, you have this shutdown. I have a shutdown sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, too much um, executive thinking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was struggling to brush my teeth and I was standing in front of the sink and I was almost in tears because I was at a client. I was with a client that was really, um, it was quite a a stressful moment for me. Um, Our communication styles weren't really matching up and I was feeling, you know, a little bit overwhelmed and I didn't understand all this stuff was happening so my executive function is going out the window I'm coming home I'm standing in front of the sink and I'm trying to brush my teeth and I like nearly start crying because I'm like why am I not able to why do why is my whole body telling me I don't want to brush my teeth and she said that it's because it's an electric toothbrush it's overstimulating you and you're already at your threshold of being overstimulated so I mean, it's important to know that I'm also um, ADHD and autistic. So there's things that come with that. I think that applies just to anyone that's ADHD as well. Um, yeah. But I got rid of the electric toothbrush and, you know, and then when I'm really overwhelmed and I know that ADHD people will understand this, having a shower, you know, um, brushing your teeth, those things in certain times of your life can become like the most daunting task in the world to you. So having, um, you know, toothpaste things that you chew on um, beside your bed can help. And she was like, when it gets really bad, um, when I'm super, super, super burnt out, I will really struggle to go near the sink because the sink smells too much and the dishcloth is too gross. Mm -hmm. And I can't, and so she was like, there's nothing telling you that you can't put everything in a plastic bag and throw it out. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You know, even though I guess it's like, it sounds wasteful, but sometimes you have to put things in place to support you. And that's extreme cases, but it's just interesting that like there's, she was like, no one, you don't have to do what other people are telling you to do. Like do what makes you happy and yeah. do what makes things easier for you. Yeah, I think that's an important message. And I think that's that's sort of um, that saying that you said, uh, like, and it based around being a consultant, a neurodivergent consultant in a neurotypical world. Mm-hmm. But then as you said, you have to be aware and it's okay for you to adapt and do those things. Put the smelly stuff in a plastic bag. Just do it. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. I think that's, I like the, you know, the, the loneliness of being a consultant, I guess you don't have the support. Um, and like I said, being a neurodivergent consultant in a neurotypical world, the good thing, I guess, is that things are changing and there's awareness um, and there's support. There was not, especially for women, there's not been the support to understand or identify. I mean, I was yeah. I had to get diagnosed in my thirties. So, you know, yeah. I've had it, I've been living with it my whole life and you mask it and being a consultant the first few years, really rough. Like you have to, um, you're terrified of, you know, doing the wrong thing. You're terrified of disappointing people. You're terrified of so many things. Um, you don't understand your own work life. So you don't have any support to go to someone and say, Hey, I, I don't 
I'm spiraling. I don't know what's happening. So I think it's good when you are in a workplace now that you can bring those things up and I've kind of started applying it in my own way to my own clients and my own business. So I think, I think that's really been a saving grace is being able to put that in place. That's great. And you, you know, you are very good at being open and transparent. And I think, um, you know, I know as someone that works with you every week, I appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure your clients do as well. So I think, yeah, even that in itself is a great takeaway. Let's see whether it comes up in these pros, cons and tips for working together. It might, I don't know. <laughs> so let's let's see. And look, this is what normally happens. By the time we go through this, we've probably touched on some of them already, but I'll quickly go through the list of pros that you came up with. So you have diverse perspectives. So diverse thinkers often think differently, brings Mm -hmm. fresh, innovative approaches to problem solving and compliance strategies. There's attention to detail. Many diverse thinkers, particularly those with conditions like autism or ADHD, may have exceptional attention to detail, which is crucial for the the nature of this ISO-conforming world that we live in or work Mm -hmm. in. Well, we live and work in it, don't we? Um, mm-hmm. Another pro <clears throat> you said was strong strong analytical skills. Diverse thinking consultants may excel in analytical thinking and data analysis, helping to identify patterns and insights that might be missed by others. And that's systematic too, I'm just going to add, because, you know, you can see systems and processes and the links as well, I'm guessing. You can come back and circle back to that one if you want two more to go you said persistence and dedication they may demonstrate high levels of perseverance and commitment to their work oh my goodness I love that often going above and beyond to ensure tasks are completed thoroughly and Mm -hmm. then finally honesty oh here we go and direct communication. Diverse thinkers often communicate in a straightforward manner, which can lead to clear and honest discussions about conformance, compliance, and any areas for improvement. So it does come up in those pros. Have you got anything else to add now that you've heard me say them out loud? I love the straightforwardness one. um, And I think That definitely comes from the autistic side of me where I cannot, like, I'll just say something. And it's like the honesty, I guess, is pure. It's like you're not, I don't mean, I'm never like saying something to be mean. I'm just like, oh, like, I don't like that or no, thank you. Or that doesn't look that good on you. But, you know, (laughs) just like, sorry, my mum was a victim to that once. I was like, nah, not that. But that sounds, that sounds like Isaac, my son. No, mum, that's not right. That doesn't work. <laughs> and I would <laughs> someone to tell me that because I love feedback. But I think when it comes to the honesty of if I'm recommending a system or if I'm recommending something, I can be a lot more direct with what I do or don't believe. I don't feel like it's a sell or it's, I'm not very good at like sales, salesy things. Yeah. I'm just like, okay, this is, you know, these are the pros and cons of the system. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. Or people come back to me. I think it's just, it just opens the communication up a lot more because people can see that it's an open, honest, direct conversation. And that's what it should be when you're talking about, you know, things that are happening in business as well as keeping things light and interesting. There's also room for that. But you have to understand as a consultant, a lot of the businesses I work with are small to medium size. And, you know, it's their it can be the difference in a in a big chunk of money and time and missed opportunity mm-hmm. if things are done right or if they go with the wrong system. So I think that is really valuable. Yeah, because you don't want a consultant that sort of beats around the bush and tries so to make I them do this and I can yeah, do that. Like, or tells them something's great when it's not. And you know, I suppose it depends on how you deliver it. We have to be aware of that, but. That's yeah. what that's what you're there for. Like so, I, the integrity that is one of my core values is 
if I know something isn't going to work for someone, I couldn't consciously yeah. sell that to them because I just know it's not. And that's in some ways probably bad business mind, but in my world, my core values come before anything else. So that builds my business. So okay. I think it's definitely could be a con if you're a salesperson. <laughs> Well, that's that's true. But then, yeah, that's a different sort of mindset. I I do mm-hmm. love that. And um, I was actually thinking, <clears throat> I know you were here, uh, you worked here with me a few months ago, I think before. Oh, we haven't said, told anyone where you are. Where are you located, Caitlin? I'm in Canada at the moment. Yay. So I um. I've been very bold and decided I want to take on uh, whilst my my core company is in Australia and and I'm seeing really exciting things happening, a lot of um, amazing partnerships and stuff, but I've expanded now to the US and Canada. So I'm just, I'm out here doing a bit of research and partnering with companies and finding out what, what I can provide, what the solution is to some people's, you know, problems, no issues or or, and this is know. why I said you're a powerhouse. Like, look, look at look at what you've achieved. But where I was going when I realized that I think you were here the week before you left for Canada. Um, mm-hmm. And um, oh, on about that direct communication, and I think it was the first time. I oh know it might have been the second time my husband had met you, and something he said. He said, "Well." Caitlin's certainly an open book, isn't she? She just tells it how it is. And we love that. I we both love that. It's like, oh yep, yep, that's that's how it is. It's just so open and comfortable. So I'm sure your clients appreciate it. Well, yeah, I definitely feel that's the relationship I have with my clients. Like I said, I'm still yeah. like friendly with a lot of them. Um we work together a lot on stuff that comes up. They know that they can rely on me. And I feel like that feels my, you know, work is important and company in my company is my most important thing in my life right now. But like the mm-hmm. people that I work with and the relationships that I make, I uh, keep it like something that I want to sustain because, you know, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And I think we've both found a way to make it. I'm a very creative person outside of this, but I also think that I make this business very creative, which Mm -hmm. is fun for me because whilst ISO standards seem so like, you know, (laughs) in a box and like boring and dense, I'm finding different ways to show like how it, you know, can be created in your business and how it can look really different and how it's actually beneficial and like maybe, you know, just creating like something mm. new like each time mm. I go into business. You know, there's mm. similar things I implement, but it's something new. And I think back to like some of the pros is uh, I have the ability to understand, and this is a very uh, autistic trait that you have to understand the why. And there's no middle ground. There's all or nothing. So I have to understand why everything fits together and how it all fits together and how the system is as a whole, which allows me to teach people how to maintain it and use it. So yeah. a lot of the time with ISO, people think it's a either an additional thing on the back end. They are that there's like different categories of people that are like, well, we just deal with it at the end of the year before the audit. Mm-hmm. We're not the benefit out of doing it. And they yeah. don't actually understand what it is. They can't visualize the system as a whole. And like that doesn't come with a flow chart flowcharts do nothing for me I need to see the system actively linking in and and how you're yeah. you know what you're checking on every month and and why you're checking on it and the conversations you're having and how it impacts other parts of the business so I think being able to like strip it back I'm really known for I can do complex you know I can work all the way with enterprise level businesses and I have but uh it should be scalable you should understand it mm-hmm. It should be simplified. I don't, I get lost in dense documents. I don't like over documenting things unless it's a control that's necessary. So I think stripping back, the one thing that I learned, which is a good pro is a lot of the clients like, why do we need this? Why do we have to do that? You know, and I break it down and you from a, you know, I've done my auditing course. So from my mind, I'm like, okay, interested parties, we're looking at the context of the organization, we're looking at the legal compliance. So I'm saying, well, we need to do this because 
in the standards they ask that you have this procedure in place and we need to do this because in the Australian standards or whatever regulation, I mean, in America, it's OSHA for health and safety. So you understand why you're doing it. Is it coming from an ISO requirement? Is it yeah. coming from uh, like a code or act or regulation or is it a control that you've mm-hmm. put in place as per your um you know, maybe your principal contractor has asked you to do it. Maybe a tender application has asked you to do it, or maybe it's your own control that you've put in place based on risk. So having that understanding and being able to explain that to someone, they go, oh, okay, now I get it. So I say, you can do this. It's optional. You have to do this. You could make it look like this. I think that flexibility gives people a lot of confidence in what I can deliver to them. Yeah. And that is the part yeah. that's a pro of being neurodivergent. Love it. Yeah. I love loved that. hearing you talking about all of that. <laughs> I then. know. I like, no <laughs> Look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. So they're the pros, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what about the cons? And I'm going to go through the list that you mm-hmm. put together as well first and then you can share and further expand. So the cons, oh, this is interesting. Hold on. The cons is talking about communication styles. So even, you know, we've got direct communication or honesty and direct communication was a pro. In the first thing in the cons is a communication style. So we've said different communication preferences or styles may require some adjustments. I think we've touched on that earlier and understanding from both parties to ensure effective collaboration. I think you mentioned shared responsibility earlier. Mm -hmm. The next one is sensory sensitivities. So some neurodivergent individuals may have sensory sensitivities and you've shared some of your own as well. It could be noise light. You've talked about your electric toothbrush as well, the shower, et cetera that could affect their working environment or how they participate in certain activities. Another con is a need for a structured environment. They may thrive best in structured environments with clear routines and expectations or any changes or lack of clarity could be challenging. That's an interesting one. A couple more, social interaction. So, Um, Social or office politics might be less intuitive for some neurodivergent consultants, potentially leading to misunderstandings. That might be an interesting one for you to extract. And then finally, a potential for overwhelm. So high-pressure situations, and you've already shared this, Caitlin. Um, So high-pressure situations or environments with a lot of stimuli could be overwhelming. Um, potentially affecting performance. So is there Mm -hmm. anything that stood out there that you can pull out for us a little bit more? Yeah, well, I think all of those things are really, you know, they're all, everyone has pros and cons and things, their strengths and weaknesses. That's why they ask you those, you know, interesting questions in interviews. And I think, um, I think it's like, I used to think that was stupid questions when they would say, <laughs> you know, interview, what's your strengths, what's your weaknesses, and you'd always do a weakness that you could, you know. Um, Improve on. Flip into mm. some sort of actual, it's it's an, it's an a weakness but it's actually not and all this kind of stuff where it's like, okay, but actually there are weaknesses that are dead set weaknesses about being neurodiverse, um, divergent. So for me, uh all of them can be maintained or managed in a in a plan, and I think that we found um, some tools that were helpful. Um, I think on a on a deeper level, I think I'm really aware that it's hard to get support for ADHD from the healthcare system, in, no matter what country you're in. So I want to make that really clear. Um, it's not just like oh, just go and get some help. Like I know that it's super hard to find a psychiatrist. It's super hard to find a psychologist. It's really difficult to get in and, and pay for all of those things with healthcare. I mean, it was still expensive for me to do that. Um, there's different things you can do. But the things that I found, I had to make a lot of sacrifices for my business at a time and, you know, financially everything. I had to put all of my energy and 
and money into finding ways to help me. So those things will happen if you don't have plans in place, burnout, poor time management, uh, emotional dysregulation is a big thing. So you could go to work and, and have, you know, massive arguments with people or get really mm-hmm. upset and, you know, you could really struggle with um, time management because you're on medication. So like for me, I can't physically do anything work related before 9am because I take medication that, you know, I don't sleep very, I, I cannot get to sleep until a certain time. So I work with that. And that's something that my therapist told me. She was like, well, if you're still getting enough sleep and there's no commitments that you have to work around. So I'm, you know, fortunate that because I'm in Canada, um, I don't have a lot of, like my meetings will go later. So it suits me better. So I'll have like 2 p.m. until 11 p.m. is like my prime time. Um, So understanding that and then working towards it. So I guess you can adjust it also if, you know, I used to start work at like 5 a.m., stuff like that. And I, I managed to do it. But I think you have to be aware that that's something you have to manage, not just reactive so deal with it once it becomes a problem I think dealing with it before it becomes a problem and checking in and knowing if someone's saying like if I was working in an office again um, I think that I would have to have a really clear plan in place of like this is the times that I come into work this is you know what I can do when I work from home Um, these are the things that overstimulate me I used to get in trouble all the time for having headphones on in the office Mm -hmm. And people would say, I can't, you're not hearing me. I'm like, well, stop interrupting me. (laughs) I hate being interrupted. (laughs) Like I am in the zone right now. And it takes so much for me to get my mind, you know, powering. If someone comes in and interrupts me, it's really triggering for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's really annoying. It's really, really annoying. And I know that, you know, people think, well, I want something from you right now, but I'm like, well, I don't work like that. So if I, (laughs) you know, it's really difficult. And I know you have to find a balance of that, you know, whatever in the workplace, but I had to have my headphones on because I was too distracted by everyone on the calls around me. And, you know, it was so overwhelming. Um, I think, but knowing, just communicating. So I knew all these things because I went did the whole expensive long process and I'm still not even anywhere near where I want to be to manage my ADHD. Um, but there's tools like you can have uh, like things written up. You can go to an occupational therapist, which is something I'm trying to start doing um, where they will map out your sensory load from home to the workplace and map out your ideal work day and show you yeah. where your sensory overload is so you can maintain it, which I think is really great. And I can't wait to start doing that because it's yeah. that next level of, you know, I had, I got into bad habits because I'm like, well, I'm working late and I'm getting up late and like all these things where I had to like really manage, go back to the basics of managing my ADHD. But what I'm saying is all the cons can be managed if you yeah. are aware of them and minimized them, you know, the, and it's like anything, my reaction time now to things is so much more minimized because whilst you're never going to um, be able to eradicate or like, you know, it's like trauma, you can never like completely get rid of it, mm. but your reaction to something can, you know, maybe it's three days that you're upset about something or it might just be half an hour and you move on. So yeah. at work, instead of being like, maybe you do have an outburst and say, stop interrupting me. And then you can stop and like, maybe you have 10 minutes and you go, sorry for speaking to you like that. I just yeah. really struggle when someone interrupts me. Like, I think yeah. those things are important too. Like you can never really, I think people don't understand how much time you spend trying not to be affected by the rest of the world and overstimulated. Like there was a quote I found, I need to find it. And it was like, you spend so much time trying to maintain and manage the levels of stress that you're constantly under just being neurodivergent. And then one little outburst is upsetting yeah. to somebody that's like, I'm doing, I'm all day, I'm trying not to do this. And you're just dealing with one little moment. So, yeah. And that's all they see. They don't understand yeah. the other stresses that you've actually been managing. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's, that's a light bulb moment. Absolutely. We can all, yeah. Yeah. Take note of that, people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you can. That can apply to anybody. Mm. And, and 
the thing about ADHD is like it's really similar to someone that has trauma. Um, they can have the same effects of, you know, anxiety and depression and all those things that come with it or um, the side effects like you get sometimes they get OCD tendencies and that's a side effect of it and like all these little they're not little at all, I'm not minimizing it. All those things that make up myself are really um, individual things that I deal with every day. But I think a lot of people are still going through some of the things that uh, neurodivergent people are feeling. So yes, um, a lot of people experience OCD, a lot of people experience anxiety and depression and emotional dysregulation, whether it be from stress or relationships. So it's not that uncommon. I think that it's really great that there's a spotlight on it now and people are understanding it. That's your your brain, you know, makeup. But I think it's also something that could be applied to anybody in the workplace yeah. um, as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think the big takeaway for me with that one, like while this section was around the cons, you did mention, well, you know, while it's in a cons list, they can all be managed. I think you use the word if you're aware, when you're aware. So you can apply, um, I suppose, what what you've learned, how to manage it through your awareness. Um, and it might be what you said before, when you come up with your weaknesses, you can turn it into, you know, a, a strength or make, oh, yeah, but it's actually this. But I, I suppose it's sort of in that same vein. But we're not saying these cons as a negative. We're saying it for awareness so that that uh, you do you something, can... put something in place. Like, yes. like I said, don't be reactive about it. And yes. You yes. could see the signs of me progressively losing <laughs> grip <laughs> if you yes. were around me and you would know that my, all my friends are aware of things that are, they know me so well now that they will know before I get to my meltdown moment yep. of, okay, yep. this has happened, this has happened, she won't like the feeling of that or that's yep. happened. So they can predict because it's quite predictable. It's not out yep. of the blue. It's very predictable. There's very known signs of things that I can handle and can't handle. So that plan being in place is more so like you might see someone um, progressively, you know, their mood's changing or someone with ADHD yes. is coming in. So you might be able to just mitigate that a little bit more by saying, okay, we're aware that this might happen. Maybe saying to them, you know, if you're, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, do you want to go for a walk or like, um, not pressing them, knowing you can see their physical symptoms coming out and saying, well, why is this not done? Because that might be the, the yeah, thing that, <laughs> back yeah. with them. And yeah. there's no need you should be able to manage people and being, you know, managing staff or managing anyone that you work with relationships. I think um, whether it be personal, professional is really important to the growth of business. And that was on that podcast he was listening to this morning. And he was like, <laughs> you know, people are talking about negotiating um pay rises and he was like uh if you have done everything like if you have brought all you've done all these projects and you've worked on it and said I want to add value to the business and I want to do this and this is what I'm going to achieve and I'm going to show my worth instead of just saying like I want a pay rise but then the company turns around a year later and says oh that you know that's not available anymore well that's not somebody that you're going to want to work with and that's showing mm -hmm. how the relationships are with their you know, with every interaction that they have and they they won't sustain that business if they don't, you know, work with their employees and in, with their clients and their customers. So nurturing the people that you are interacting with is really important. And I think yeah. that comes with clients, that comes with my, you know, um, partners, partnerships and business and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. like moments where I've said to you, I just want to, you know, blow, <laughs> I, just, I get so angry about some things and you're like, you know, maybe yeah. look at it this way or like, don't, and I don't, I'm not, I'm super reactive. So I won't ever say something in a reactive moment because I know that that's not my intention. Okay. That's an uncontrollable, you know, yeah. process. To give yourself through. space. Yeah. And some people yeah. find that um, really confronting when mm -hmm. you uh, don't react straight away and they think that they're being punished or, that you're being immature, but I'm like, no, I just can't control my emotions. I have emotional dysregulation and uh, I don't want to say something that is not yeah. how I actually feel. And nine times out of 10, I'll come back and be like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I don't need to be so, you know, about that. I think we can all take that one on board. Mm. 
I think that's good. I think that- that's the golden rule for me. Yeah. Never, ever. I will always write an email in a notepad if I'm upset. I was going to say, that. don't hit send. <laughs> don't hit send. You can always give something at least half an hour to breathe. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's good advice for anyone, I think. <laughs> I've, so I've never regretted that. Let's just say I've never regretted not sending something straight away. Yeah, yeah. Because also you think of, for me overnight, you think of think of something else overnight, or you rethink it as well, and or you give it a different perspective. Well, that's the thing. In that um, to the negotiator guy was saying, he was like, you can't, you kind of like stop being so mad at somebody, um, and obviously don't apply this to every situation. Um, like there's certain things that I would probably not apply this to, but let's just say, for instance, I was at work and I was having a really hard time with somebody and we were just clashing constantly about mm-hmm. something. If I stopped and then like the situation, he said there was these high powered people. One was from one, um, religion, one was from another. They were, um, constantly, you know, high performers, but not getting along at work. And maybe, you don't get a like a complete resolution out of something. But if you stop and think, okay, what is this person's, like explain back to that person what you think their angle is or what you think their thought process is. It kind of yeah. stops you from being so, um, I guess, blinded by your own viewpoint. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. It's a little bit more when you have to stop and like, just because you don't agree with somebody's point of view, yeah. there's still things that you can do to work through it and there's some yeah. core values that you're just like I just don't I don't agree with that but yeah. it can diffuse it a little bit more um if you try and see it from someone else's point of view but another thing that I will add because I I did apply this is something where I did understand it from someone's point of view and I understood you know why they felt like that even though in some some ways I didn't agree with it but it doesn't really change the impact it has on you and that's a really important thing. Whilst you might be able to come to an understanding and maybe there's a client where I'm like, I get that, I get how you see that point. I understand why you think like that. However, the impact on me is too great and I don't want to continue yeah. this. It doesn't change the impact, yeah. but it might, you know, give you a bit more context of why they think that way. Yeah, yeah. And again, there's that open communication, isn't it? I mean, I... I'm not a professional. I just regurgitate a lot of stuff I listen to on podcasts. I go to therapy. We've been going for years and years and years, seven years, I think. So I am just speaking from the way I interpret things. And and yes, that's, um, I would urge anybody that wants, that is thinking that they're neurodivergent or they want support to start the process of finding their own professional help. Um, and then these tools that you, you know, this podcast and there's people's opinions and that's really helpful context to make up your own mind. But yeah, ultimately yeah. I think the biggest takeaway for anything is always find the right support for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into the last section, which is tips on working together. And you've probably covered all of them in your stories and it's a natural discussion from the pros and cons, etc. So mm-hmm. there's just like five or so tips here. Foster open communication, so regular check-ins, clear direct communication can help address any issues and ensure everyone's in, um, on the same page. I feel like I'm repeating what you've already told us, so that's per- that's perfect. Create a supportive environment. Again, you, you've, or you've, you've discussed this and thank you very much. Make accommodations as needed. Uh, quiet workspaces so this is a physical environment um, as well or flexible work hours so you've already shared about how you work best and what you'd expect if you were ever in the office etc leverage your strengths so assign tasks that play to your strengths so you know whether you're and you talked about this I think previously when you were working in the corporate world like you were undiagnosed at that point, but you tended to, you know, um, work on the the detailed analysis side of things or project management, creative side of things, problem solving. So you naturally sort of ended up there, which obviously are your strengths. 
Um, promote an understanding, so educate um, the team about neurodiversity so that ensures that you know, or it fosters that inclusion and a more supportive work environment. So that goes with that open communication as well. But it's also understanding and what you're doing now is helping greatly, so thank you. And finally, encourage flexibility and adaptability. So be open to adjusting work processes and expectations to better suit the diverse needs of the team. So I know you've shared stuff already that touches on, I think, all of those points. Is there something in there that you can wrap it all up with, Caitlin? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought of a really interesting story. Um, I don't think I don't think, I don't know if we have time to go into that, but yeah, it was just like, please share. So I'll give you my summary and then I'll give you the story. So I think the okay. summary is there is no clear roadmap for any workplace or person. So you start with communication and finding the resources to assist you. If you're in a workplace where you've already identified that you have, you know, an one or multiple um neurodivergent staff members, maybe it is worth looking into what resources are available to help create an environment from a professional coming in and telling you that or getting a professional to come in because, you know, I've worked at places big and small where they'll get people to come in and teach you what your um, personality type is and, you know, that, you know, I don't know what it's called, but they do that personality type um, with, and that helps you understand like, the instructions people need and stuff like that. So, like disc, okay. disc styles. Yeah, kind of like yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Which I think there's got to be a bit more of a like modern take on how to deal with different personalities and different, you know, needs in a workplace. I think really embracing that because I guess, so I guess understanding who it is that you have working for you and both of you coming to the table with what are your needs and expectations and how can you fit those together so I think that's really important like a clear understanding I want to clearly understand what is valuable to you is it really going to bother you that I come in five minutes late yes or no so so what's what's important yeah some people are like I saw you come in late but then you know is it really a big deal when you work late or you get more work done than anyone else but your time yeah. management is just a little bit off. I mean, I personally don't like coming in late, but I can't see an issue with it if the output is great, you know? Yeah. Like, and I think just really understanding all those factors and getting outside support to help you if needed, if you can't come up with those solutions on your own, looking for the resources, educating yourselves, both parties being educated and understanding what the needs are. And then I would suggest, and then this is a, an example of why it is important to do that. And I think I've, this is a while ago, so uh, I don't think people realise that, you know, ADHD was a thing. It was when I was a lot younger. And I had come from, I was working in the mining industry um, and I'd had many ups and downs and amazing relationships and hard relationships from that. So I think, uh, and it came from female, male all that kind of stuff. So it was a mixed pot of things. But I had a a supervisor or I guess like a department lead that we just did not get along. And he probably couldn't understand the level of um, PTSD that I might have had from uh, just being spoken to badly. And he had put me under a lot of pressure one day but didn't understand the goings on of the department. So they're, you know, sitting up here, they don't understand the technical things. There was a lot of technical stuff happening with the system that I was using. And I knew that I was being set up to fail because I was smart enough to know that the data that was input wasn't pulling correctly. So then the report that I was trying to put together for a meeting wasn't going to be true. And then the negotiation was not going to be great. And so because I had so much knowledge, I was, uh, struggling to put all of that into context for people that didn't understand at the time. And all I was getting told was someone standing over my shoulder saying, why is this not done? And it was like really late at night and I had an hour train trip home and I was like staying late and I just snapped back and I was so upset that I was being put under so much pressure and I couldn't articulate why all this stuff wasn't working. And I was so stringent on, well, I don't want you to go into this meeting 
if you don't have the correct data. Yeah. And uh, I must have sna- I must have said like I'm tr- like I said something snappy, like raised my voice and said something. I can't remember what the exact words were. That moment on, the tone of that person changed. They tried to get me in trouble. At I was constantly called into HR. I was constantly watched. If they would look up my search history, they would look up the times that I came in, they would look up who I was speaking to, they would ask other people that I was working with how long certain tasks should take in my role. And every time that I would get drug into a meeting room, I would get in trouble for this, I would get in trouble for that. So the pressure was building so much that my OCD was coming out really strong. And then I was really struggling. I was like backfiring. I was like having to write things down a million times, like repeat words. And I was like under so much pressure. But then I was also kind of like, well, you know, I was prepared to come into this battle with this guy. So every time I would get in trouble, I'd be like, uh, well, here's A, B, C, D. And I was like, well, you can't measure it because I'm doing this and you can't, you know, how would you be able to measure it? And then I started uh, researching terminology. So I would say things like I, I want HR in here because he was trying to get me in trouble for this report. Mm -hmm. And I said, I went back then and did my research and I laid it all back out. And I said, you're setting me up to fail. This is my level of role. This is the task that you're asking me to do. They're actually a specialist role. And these are the things that are wrong with the system. So that's not going to work. And I just kept putting it in terminology. Like, I don't feel comfortable around you. I don't like your tone using I don't like being set up to fail. I don't like being called into this room to have meetings about you setting me up to fail. So I put it all back, but it took such a toll on my mental state that I was having anxiety attacks. I was going home. I was having severe depression. I was then stopped. I wasn't able to perform. And it was so awful. It was such an awful time in my life. And then I got, um, taken away from working with that person and I felt I felt like there was a lot of PTSD underlying because it was a male speaking so badly to me um and he obviously didn't appreciate me snapping at him so it felt like a misogynistic situation to me because as soon as there was like any kind of backchat it was like okay well I'm going to pin you for everything and I'm going to like spend all this time to get us you know a low level person in trouble when you were head of a department. It just seemed like a waste of resources. Yeah. And so I then got changed to another team and it was with somebody that just let me, you know, here's, here's our problem. Let, can you just figure out a solution for it? I overachieved in that role. Like I was so happy. I excelled. I saved so, I was able to save crazy amounts of money for the business. I was able to like come up with all these solutions. I was able to fix these reports. I overachieved so much to point to, you know, there was times where like the CFO would come down to my desk personally and like, you know, congratulate me and stuff like that. So the difference in my performance, you know, was so so varied I went into HR and HR at the time before I got changed over they were like you know we think that you're dealing with this they tried to put it back on to me that it was my mental health that it was like you know I needed to go and see someone about having OCD and they started labeling me and I was you know it was a really confusing time and I'm sure it's not like that now and I'm sure that um you know those things Maybe they do go on, but I'm I'm sure there's a lot more education around it. But yeah. the reason I bring those stories up is because I was one, you know, one person with two very different stories mm-hmm. because of the way I was managed. Yes. Yes. And thank you, because that that is an amazing way, I think, to finish finish up because yeah, you you've shared this work environment which is you know one of the things that we've talked talked about you know encouraging flexibility adaptability leveraging strengths creating a supportive environment open communication all of those tips and you shared the first experience where it was all this negative turmoil and then when you were moved to that completely different environment you were able to demonstrate how you can flourish. There are complete, I know this is what the intent of your story was, complete opposites. The first experience was you went backwards, you were spiraling because of that negative influence. And then 
you flicked over and possibly uh, it took and- you some time, Caitlin, like to to you know get over I the first. I actually felt like it was an instant relief, to be honest. It really? Obviously took time to uh, feel less anxious and yes, the immediate physical lifting of the pressure that came with oh. It's probably that yep. sensory overload of like, yes. and yes. there was a there was a lady that I worked with, and another example of this where the sensory thing was happening. I loved her; she was an amazing human. I sat next to her; she grinded her teeth. Grinded. Oh no! That is probably my like one big. And I felt like it was hurting me; like I felt like someone was like yeah. hurting the chest, and I would say, uh, like I can't, I can't handle that noise. And so one day I just got up and I ripped my computer out and I moved it because I was like, I'm about to, I'm about to lose my entire mind because my whole body is radiating with rage from yep. the sound. Didn't have any yeah. idea that's what's happening because I kept asked to be moved and no one would move me because they said, no, you have to work together. And I was like, I just can't do the sound. I'm yeah. I like, I can't do it. And so I moved and I was very dramatic about it in my, in the way <laughs> I did it, but then the person started crying and they were very upset that I didn't want to sit next to them. So I said, I don't want anyone else involved. I don't want the manager in here. I don't want HR in here. I have a good relationship with this person. So I sat her down in the meeting room and I said, I love you. I told her all the things I liked about her, about all the things I like working with her, all the things I thought she was really brilliant at. And I said, this is nothing personal. Yep. this is me needing to be by myself because there's something going on with me and I don't know what it is, but I cannot do it. Yeah. And after that, I took her for a coffee. She, we were best friends. And yeah. it was that, you know, because I didn't want to make it such a big deal where like yeah. I knew that, and I mean, I just knew that I needed to communicate with her so that she was seeing it from a genuine point of view. If we started getting all the leaderships involved and all that, it would feel like, you know, something different. But I was like, I wanted to be very raw and honest with her and say, like, you're an amazing person. You're doing great. Everything. Yeah. This, this shouldn't make you feel upset. It's my something that's going on with me that I can't figure out. Yeah. And you were right at, at that stage you weren't aware you, aware of it like you you weren't I diagnosed I, I had another yeah 10 years yeah. Me, so. yeah that's right so you know and you were doing the best you could and coping with whatever was going on so that's and amazing like to control like that could have been easily avoided with just letting me put my noise cancelling headphones on oh yeah because that would have been identified earlier on yeah that's right that's right. Caitlin, I want to say thank you so much. Like this has been amazing. Um, yeah, thank you so much for opening up. Thank you so much for sharing your own experiences um, and your own stories, uh, you know, including challenges. Um and also, yeah, where you've overcome it um, and, you know, where, where you've progressed. Actually, before, I'll, I'll finish off because I wrote some quick things down mm-hmm. just, just to round everything up. So thank you for the, from the bottom of my heart. You know I love you to bits and love working with you every week. Um, the key things, I'll just wrap, wrap up, outside support. Caitlin talked about getting that outside support. There is no clear roadmap. Like, you know, Caitlin mentioned this earlier. That's why it's great to get that outside support. I loved you mentioned shared responsibilities earlier on, and that's that's come out uh, a few times. Clear understanding. And again, you mentioned this clear understanding from, from both, both parties. There's so much more. <laughs> that that was uncovered in this. They're just the things that I quickly wrote down that sort of stuck in my head. So thank you again. I can't can't thank you enough. So everyone, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jackie, for having me on and you know sharing the spotlight on the topic because I think that it's super important and I don't, you, there are a lot of podcasts talking about it, but I think especially in the consulting space and ISO, um, I don't really hear much of this topic. 
And I just want to say thank you for all of your help and your support. And I truly, truly couldn't have done the things that I've achieved without your support. And I think for anyone that's interested in working with Jackie, that you will just gain so much that you might not have even thought that you would be going into it gaining. So I think um, Jackie didn't even have any tools to understand, you know, my brain or the way that, you know, I needed to work, but you have already got that, um, I guess the aptitude to figure it out. Like you, you, that's the, that's the most amazing thing about working with you, Jackie, is that you are able to understand, you know, different scenarios and give advice on different things and make someone feel comfortable and not just from like, a, you know, a systematic point of view, but even the things that you were telling me about, you know, just own the way that you look, call in the people that you want to work with, like, um, and the open communication, there's just been open communication from the start. So I think you're amazing. I'm so excited for the people that get to work with you and interact with you. And I can't wait to see um, what you do. Thanks, Caitlin. It goes both ways. And I think yeah, I learn a lot from everyone I work with as well. So greatly appreciated. Thank you. That wrap, wraps up today's episode, obviously, on embracing diverse thinkers, strategies for inclusive and effective collaboration. We truly hope you found our discussion valuable. I know I did. Remember to join us next week where we'll be discussing a brand new topic and quite different. Um, and we actually have another guest author um, along with us, Kevin Sanders. And he's going to be discussing the successful audit formula. So you will love that as well. So until next time, keep leading the standard and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us once again as we lead the standard. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes just like this. And don't forget to leave a review if you found today's episode informative and inspiring. If you're already an ATOL student, remember participating in live Q&A sessions just like this is one of the exclusive perks of your enrolment. And if you're not already a student, join us at our website, www.auditortrainingonline.com to learn more about our courses and how you can start making a difference in your career in ISO management system standards. So join us again next week as we not just meet the standards, but we lead them.